Okay. Uh, cool. Well, thank you, everyone. Um, so I will try to conclude this uh, very enriching uh, day of conversation um, by trying to present some words about uh, how blockchain, Web3, Metaverse, and all these things is actually contributing to shaping our, our digital future, and in particular, how blockchain technology can help us uh, reimagine or reinvent uh, specific institutions that uh, are key to our society, such as money, law, economics, and many other things. So it all begins in 1999 um, with uh, Neil Stephenson, that actually was perhaps the first one to envision the possibility of creating an anonymous, decentralized peer-to-peer uh, -peer cryptocurrencies that will operate independently of any governmental structure. And then 10 years later, we have uh, Satoshi Nakamoto, which maybe has read uh, the cryptonomicons, and uh, uh, actually launched Bitcoin, potentially as a response to the 2008 financial crisis, um, where we have observed that some of the trusted uh, authorities or financial institutions that we thought could be trusted actually were not necessarily acting in our interest. And so the idea of creating this system, these trustless systems that uh, uh, eliminate the need of trusting the centralized authority and instead, as long as we trust the underlying technology, as long as we have confidence in the way in which it operates, then uh, we should be fine. And so what it creates is that it opens up uh, a new window for imagination uh, by showing that anyone can potentially create their own magic internet money. And uh, in the space of just a few months and years, we have uh, a Cambrian explosion of uh, cryptocurrencies, blockchain tokens that emerge, each one with their own specificity and distinctive features, and kind of like trying to compete with one another for attention in order to increase their value uh, by providing different blockchain with different features or by providing specific services on top of those blockchains. Um, but of course, those tokens are really useful for speculations, uh, but because of the volatility that comes with them, then there is some issue when we want to use them as an actual unit of account. Um, so stable coins come about, um, introducing again some question around the trustlessness of the systems, uh, as we have some stable coins that actually depend on centralized entity that need to collect fiat currency that can then be redeemed. And so we introduce new trusted actors, but also uh, in the case of algorithmical stable coin, then we need to trust that somehow the algorithm will be able to cope with any type of uh, uh, market environment. And of course, as we have seen uh, in the last few months, not all stable coins are actually stable, uh, as we've seen with the recent crash of Terra Luna, uh, when there are some uh, market um, situations that actually destroy the peg, then it becomes very difficult to actually maintain it. And then more, more important question with regard to the non-algorithmic and stable coins, there is a few issues that uh, are raised about to which extent uh, is there an actual uh, full reserve of uh, the fiat currency that should be redeemable against the stable token. So all these trustless system that was introduced with cryptocurrency starts to kind of become a little bit more trusted uh, when stablecoin comes about. And then uh, for Chris, <laughs> um, we of course has like in the last uh, few weeks, uh, the FTX saga, uh, which uh, somehow ironically has shown that um, what happened is exactly what the cryptocurrency like Bitcoin were originally intended to avoid. Uh, so in just the matter of a few years, we managed to actually replicate exactly the same system uh, that we thought blockchain technology will solve. And so somehow, something, somewhere, we don't know, uh, something went a little bit wrong. But uh, we don't really have to worry because um, blockchain technology is not only give us the possibility to create cryptocurrency, but also uh, to create some complicated system where code is low or low is code, uh, but basically creating our own system of contractual uh, frameworks and potentially property rights. And so we get all these beautiful uh, innovation uh, because we don't really trust CeFi, uh, then we can innovate and we can create DeFi, which comes with specific properties, uh, mainly providing greater confidence in the fact that no centralized authority can defect uh, or can try to uh, create some kind of uh, um, frauds and whatnot. 
Um, and also comes with this permissionless nature and uh, uh, very importantly, decomposability. So because it is permissionless, anyone can come in and plug themselves onto the system by creating uh, a, a, an additional plugin to the, to the overall model and creates like this very sophisticated system of DeFi. Um, and so everything works well as long as things work well. Uh, and so this uh, principle of Cody's law is actually very powerful in uh, ensuring that we don't really need the law because the code is actually replacing it. Uh, but of course, even DeFi doesn't always escape from uh, issues, whether those are like scams, hacks, uh, crashes because of the market, and especially because of the composability, we have this kind of systemic risk that emerge because there is this kind of repercussion on all the value chains. And so all of a sudden, whenever those problems happen, uh, even though we felt that code is low, at some point we don't really want that code is low because actually code doesn't really work as we wish. Um, and what is interesting is that it actually shows that the market environment actually becomes some kind of uh, constitutive element to the way in which we decide to perceive the notion of blockchain property. And as long as the market is good and uh, uh, we're happy with the outcome, then code is low. Uh, but as soon as the market is a bit less good and uh, or the code actually fails us, then the law should actually prevail over the code. Um, another uh, quite revolutionary technology that uh, also touch upon the question of property uh, is NFTs, which is mostly used by artists or uh, people issuing collectible. Um, and what is really interesting with this is that it enabled the, this new notion that is actually quite uh, revolutionary, the notion of digital property, because it's actually quite strange to talk about property when we're talking about the digital world because of the immateriality of the medium, then it doesn't really make sense because I, I get something, I can reproduce it, and so how can we actually create property in a place when there is no scarcity? And of course, we have solved the problem uh, long ago because information is also immaterial. Um, and so in the digital world, we kind of solve the problem of scarcity uh, which, because we want property uh, through artificial scarcity, which is provided to us by copyright law. And so we can now create intellectual property, which enable us to transact with information on the internet uh, in the same way as we will transact with uh, physical property. And so we can see how there is like different layers that emerge. Uh, so we have like the general work of authorship that uh, as an immaterial uh, entity is not, is not constrained by any type of scarcity except for the artificial scarcity that we create via copyright law. Uh, and then this work can be incorporated into a digital file, which, because of the digital nature of this file, does not, is not subject to any type of scarcity as such. And then today, we can now finally uh, encapsulate or reference this digital file into a token into an NFT, which will then represent the unique and authentic copy of this file, um, which is not subject to artificial scarcity in the legal sense of things, but that is subject to this new type of virtual or, or digital scarcity that actually comes from a technical perspective. And so uh, that's how we talk then of Web3. So we're not just receiving information, we're not just receiving an providing exchange information, but now we can also own the content or the digital resources that we're interacting with every day. And what is very revolutionary with this is that um, with regard to copyright, which was originally the only way in which we could actually create property over uh, those digital contents, now uh, digital artists can, for the first time in history, uh, actually monetize their work without having to rely on uh, the licensing or the transfer of copyright, but what they sell is the actual digital and authentic copy of their works. And this is actually very interesting because it creates many new opportunities for new business models and uh, new opportunity for the artists to connect and exchange directly with, uh, with their fans. Um, but if we look at uh, the practicality of it, um, how things are actually being uh, made, uh, we can see that the large majority of uh, the trading of NFTs happen on those uh, centralized marketplaces, uh, which are slightly 
um, starting to look very similar to those traditional trusted intermediaries, but also um, are kind of acting as some form of gatekeepers. Uh, first of all, because they actually, because we have like way too many NFTs in the world, uh, there needs to be some kind of filter, and so people need to apply in order to be able to join those marketplaces, which are the most um, the most uh, elitist. Um, but also, those marketplaces uh, provide the possibility to um, to choose them by themselves. They choose what are the licensing rights by which those NFT are actually being uh, exchanged, and they also get the possibility to choose. Uh, whether or not to actually enforce the royalty system that are embedded into those uh, into those NFTs, and then finally and perhaps more critically, they also have some kind of censorship power uh, because even though of course no one can censor the NFT as such because it exists on the blockchain, but because those platforms become like the main way in which people are accessing and uh, and visualizing those uh, NFTs, if they choose to actually censor them, then it will drastically decrease the uh, the market value of those uh, NFTs because they cannot be traded in the same way as the others. Um, and so this brings us to, to this question of to which extent uh, are, is this new technology, are NFTs actually revolutionizing uh, the, the, the art world as, uh, as it was initially believed. Uh, but when we look at how this ecosystem operates, we can see that there is also uh, quite a lot of frauds and scams. There is also um, a lot of market manipulation uh, because people are engaging into like pumping and dumping those NFTs in order to actually speculate over them. And so while there is this very amazing opportunity, and this is actually a, quite a revolution, this concept of digital property, at the same time, we see how this is pretty much replicating the same dynamics that the art market has been doing for a long time and actually exacerbating those dynamics. And also with the advent of new actors like uh, Christie's or Sotheby's that are established in the art world that are now entering the space, we can see how slowly this is actually being re Re-co-opted, our uh, control is actually coming into this space also from the from the traditional art world, with the exception that uh, the people that choose what is what is valuable and what is not valuable are no longer the traditional intermediary like the art critics or uh, the institution of the art world, but are usually like crypto collectors or crypto investors or crypto billionaires, which obviously have a very peculiar taste. Um, and eventually it appears that the most valuable NFTs are things that perhaps most of the art critics will be quite afraid of. Um, and so once again, maybe something has gone wrong. It's not clear. Um, but we should not worry too much because the um, one, one of the key contribution of this, this notion of digital property is that it actually enables us to design and to implement these metaverse in an open and decentralized and interoperable way where the interoperability can actually be enforced through the technology. And so we speak a lot about Web3, but we don't speak enough about Web4. Uh, Web4 is the next step, uh, and this is when we add to the read, write, and own, we add the space. So the special element, which is the metaverse. And that means that all of a sudden we actually can situate ourselves into space. We can actually move from one place to the other, and we can have special relationship with other people in the metaverse and with specific assets into the metaverse. And so this means that all of a sudden we are not just like nicks, uh, nicknames behind uh, a screen, but we actually become, we can incarnate ourselves into avatars, and those avatars, of course, they can also, they have a location, but they can also have things. They can, they can own assets, uh, they can dress up, they can hold accessories and so forth. And of, of course, um, there is now a very big business that is emerging around propertization and like selling accessory for uh, uh, avatars. Uh, and obviously the uh, luxury brand did not miss the opportunity. And we have like brands like Gucci and Balenciaga that are really innovating in this space. Uh, this is an interesting anecdote. Um, this Gucci bag, which was sold on Roblox, 
for uh, about 4,000 Robux, which is about $4,000 uh, USD. Dollars. And uh, the same bag, the equivalent of this bag in a physical boutique um, was actually sold for like 3,500. So people were actually willing to pay more for the digital version of the bag than for the actual physical version. And so this raised this interesting question of what does it even mean when we're purchasing assets for our avatars? And uh, who actually owns those assets? Um, is it our avatar? Is it us on behalf of the avatar? Or is it the centralized metaverse platforms on which this, this purchase is being done? And uh, the problem is that today the metaverse looks a little bit like this. Um, so depending on your age, uh, this might remind you or not something. Um, but back in the 90s, so when the internet was starting to make its first step into the mainstream, uh, we had companies like American Online, CompuServe, that were providing access to the internet in a very um, closed and uh, proprietary manner, where there was very little communication between the different providers, and therefore, of course, uh, people could not benefit from the permissionless innovation and from all the interoperability that the internet provides today. And so if we look at the landscape of the metaverse, today it's a little bit the same. Uh, we have a few uh, large virtual world operators that are providing access into the metaverse, uh, but all those virtual worlds are completely disconnected from one another. They do not communicate and there is no interoperability possible. And so this is where NFTs actually come to the rescue uh, because they can actually create this type of uh, adversarial uh, interoperability in the sense that to the extent that the asset does not subsist on the centralized server. Um, so for instance, in the case of the Roblox bag, I bought my bag for 5,000 bucks, uh, but because it's on Roblox, the day in which I get bored of uh, playing on Roblox and I want to move to Fortnite, uh, well, I'm, I'm out of luck because I need to actually abandon my bag because I cannot transfer it. Whereas where the bag is, if the bag is on, a, is, is on an NFT, then it doesn't exist on Roblox itself, but it exists on this decentralized um, database that is the blockchain. And that means that on the one hand, uh, the operator of the virtual world has no power to actually take it away or seize it or just destroy it because it's, it's not under its own control. But also, it makes it impossible for any operator to prevent another operator from recognizing the same assets uh, because they can just bot plug into the same database and they can visualize it at the same time. And so whether they want it or not, the, the movement of uh, uh, using NFTs as a way of actually selling digital assets is actually creating uh, interoperability, even if it's against the will of the virtual world operator. Um, and so there are already a few platforms that are uh, uh, adopting this model. So uh, when we buy things on the central land or sandbox or crypto voxel, all those assets are actually NFT assets. And interestingly, too, um, even though they could actually, because nothing prevents them from being interoperable, uh, none of those platforms have yet created a system of interoperability where they will be recognizing each other assets in each other virtual worlds. And, and this comes to the question of like, why, why is that uh, the case? And uh, of course, the, the problem is that the business model of most of those metaverses is about uh, real estate speculation. Um, so there is limited pieces of land, and uh, of course, people want to buy them and hold on to them so that they can sell it later. Um, and the goal is, of course, the, the value of this land is because there is traffic, because there is people that are going to come to this land. Um, and so there is obviously an incentive to enclose and to lock in the, the users so that they cannot escape with all their assets into another virtual world. Otherwise, of course, it's, it's harder to actually maintain the traffic. And so this we can see the, the, the irony in some way uh, where we're actually trying to create virtual worlds that are uh, replicating or simulating the constraints of the physical world. Um, we create a virtual world that are not only limited in space, whereas the digital world is theoretically infinite, but also virtual worlds that are completely flat uh, because these enable to discriminate economically between the lands that are right at the center of the metaverse, which will therefore have 
a much higher value, and then the land that sits at the corner of the metaverse, which will have less traffic and therefore is less valuable. And so, again, it seems that somehow on the way something went wrong. Uh, we have such incredible opportunity about creating open and interoperable metaverse, and we end up with like flatlands. Um, but again, maybe we don't need to worry too much uh, because uh, blockchain technology enables us not just to create cryptocurrency, not just to create our overarching legal framework, contractual uh, setup, and new property rights, but also we can create new organizations, we can use DAOs, and potentially we can create new institutions, including government institutions. And so the whole concept here is to Again, create this concept of everyone can create anything they want. And so we can also create virtual nations, um, where the concept here is uh, the opt-in citizenship. So everyone should be able to opt-in into any virtual nation that they like the most. And then, obviously, the, the concept very important of exit-based governance, which is if I don't like what's happening in my virtual nation, it's not a problem because I can move to a different virtual nation. Uh, or I could actually create my own because maybe I don't like any on the one that exi exists so far. Um, and this, all this discussion is actually becoming more and more popular in the, uh, in the crypto Web3 space, uh, perhaps thanks to this book. Um, if, I don't know if you have read this book, but uh, if you have not read it, please don't read it because it's actually extremely painful to read. Um, but basically, what's, it's, it's offering this new concept of the network state, which is um, the idea that you can have like a collective of individuals with highly aligned values uh, that manage to coordinate around collective action and then will crowdfund territories around the world, so just purchase land a little bit everywhere, uh, in order to eventually obtain uh, diplomatic recognition from other states. So, uh, that's very interesting to result of problem with this, but what's most interesting is that it's actually striking similar uh, to what Neil Stephenson had envisioned already 30 years ago uh, in the book Snow Crash with what he called the French elites, uh, which is basically in a world in which governments had, the, had gone bankrupt, um, corporations have to step in and uh, provide governmental services, obviously for a fee to the citizens, which are now consumers, um, and there are various conditions in order to be able or not to join the French elites. And so this is fiction, but it's actually not just fiction. Uh, already in 2014, we had um, BitNation, that was the first attempt at creating what they called this decentralized, borderless, voluntary nation, um, where the idea will be that, again, it's this opt-in condition, and then people can join the nation, and that they can obtain specific governmental services, such as identity management, such as notarization services, but also, of course, have your own sovereign digital currency that doesn't depend from any of the fiat currency, and then potentially use a DAO in order to have this kind of weird plutocratic governance uh, about how you want your virtual nation to be governed. So this project was interesting. It got a little bit of traction and then uh, kind of got dismissed, perhaps because also in 2014, uh, no one really understood what uh, they were trying to do. Um, but our, luckily, it's not over, so we have other attempts at creating this kind of uh, um, crypto nation and so forth. So uh, Brooke Pierce, that uh, in 2017 proposed the idea of creating a crypto utopia, uh, at least for some, because for other people it sounded more like a crypto dystopia, um, with the idea of uh, purchasing a little uh, land in a little, a little town in Puerto Rico and actually turning it into this kind of newly incorporated city that will be all governed by smart contract, cryptocurrency, and uh, basically living with some with many other. Uh, crypto bros. Um, so this also got a little bit of criticism, but people keep trying. Uh, and then we have like Blockchain LLC in 2018, uh, which purchased a large parcel of land uh, in the northern side of Nevada and started actually engaging with, um, with uh, negotiation with the state of Nevada in order to create this innovation zone uh, that will basically enable them to create uh, these blockchain-based uh, city where you have smart contract regulating everything um, and obtaining some kind of economic benefits in exchange of boosting the technological sector of Nevada. Um, and this, also, the negotiation went on for a while and then eventually uh, the government the, uh, of Nevada didn't seem so interested after all. Um, but then it continues. Uh, just a few months ago, we have Praxis that uh, raised $15 million in order to, uh, it's actually not very much, I think, for what 
what they want to do, but um, in order to purchase land somewhere, they don't know exactly where, but probably in the Mediterranean. Um, and again, they don't really want to create a sovereign state, but the goal is really to collaborate with existing national state in order to obtain some kind of like creating an autonomous economic zone, potentially a tax haven for uh, the crypto millionaires, and then of course to be able to live together with people that all care about crypto. Uh, who will then want to live in that city? And for those that have been following the uh, FTX saga, those $15 million, actually, a large portion was coming from Alameda Research, uh, which kind of questioned where this project is going. And then this one is uh, the last one, but I found it very funny. Uh, I don't know if you know this person, Akon. Uh, apparently, it's a famous uh, American singer. I didn't know about him until I discovered that he wants to create his own city, uh, the city of the future in Senegal. And um, this city, of course, will also be a blockchain city. And uh, it, the economy of this city will be based on a coin, uh, which is its, its own coin. And uh, that is issuing so people can buy this coin. And if they ever want to go to, to a city, they will be able to engage with the local economy. Um, so I don't think I need to explain <laughs> what went wrong here. But uh, yeah, we are still working on that. Um, so. All those things, though, uh, is not to say, is not to criticize the blockchain. I actually think that all those experimentations are absolutely amazing. And uh, the, the fact that things are going wrong means that there is a lot of experimentation that is actually happening. And uh, uh, it's normal that all, all those things that are kind of like trying to engage into this radical innovation fails. And it's great that they fail because then we can learn from those failures and then we can build upon them until we actually figure out something that does actually work out. Um, now, the only problem, though, is that it seems that uh, if we were to quote uh, Ford, uh, we are kind of using the technology in, are we really using it in order to create new cars, or are we using the technology in order to create faster horses? And uh, this is because as we, as we see those different cycles, it seems that history keeps repeating itself in the sense that blockchain technology provides this new radical innovation, but then at the same time, uh, it gets then instrumentalized by the existing system in order to replicate and potentially even exacerbate itself. Um, and so the question then is like, how can we bring some kind of real innovation into the space? Um, and there is like multiple ways to do this, but there is the, the possibility of really using it in order to uh, play the same game. It's just that we are creating, we're identifying new strategy to play the game and new actors can win because they have those, those, those different strategy, but it's still the same dynamics that are just replicating themselves. Uh, or we can actually try to use the technology to change the rule of the game, to actually change the payoff structure and therefore the winners will have to identify new strategies uh, that will enable them to win. And the idea is like, uh, shall we continue to try and uh, innovate in terms of creating more of those market-driven speculative dynamics that we already know, or can we actually try and design system in which cooperation uh, as opposed to competition and like abundance as opposed to digital scarcity could become a dominant strategy. Um, and to be fair, those things already exist. There is actually a lot of innovation that is happening in this space. Um, Gitcoin, of course, like for like the, the, the funding of public infrastructure, but also like we have like those new crypto commons communities that are emerging. We have like the decentralized science, regenerative finance. So there is actually a lot of innovation that is happening in the space that is trying to move away from the existing uh, rule of the game and creating new type of payoff structure. We have like a lot of experimentation with UBI. Uh, probably many of them will fail, but some of them will at least provide interesting insights so that we can build better ones. Um, and and all, those, all, all this ecosystem is actually flourishing, especially because now there is a new population of people that are entering to the blockchain space and uh, that are less interested in the money-making speculative aspect, but more into the uh, reinventing some of our institutions. And what's also interesting is that like, a lot of those things don't really need the blockchain, uh, but for some reason, the experimentation is happening today because of blockchain technology. Um, and I think it's because like, it's very difficult for existing institutions to actually innovate in a non-incremental manner because there is a lot of stake. If they actually make a mistake, which they will because we're doing new things, uh, the stake is very high and therefore failure is, is, not, is, not, uh, uh, is, not, an is not an option. Whereas 
with the blockchain system, like you can just experiment. Like most likely you're gonna fail, but the stake, the stake is sufficiently high that it's not just a game, but it's also sufficiently low that people can engage in those radical innovation without being afraid and therefore without being stuck into the incremental innovation space. Um, and then just I want to give like a few examples uh, to conclude to just show like the various uh, initiatives uh, that uh, are trying to really push the boundaries into reinventing the rule of the games, always just by, by discovering new mechanisms and new protocols within the blockchain system. So uh, Dada, which is uh, one of the con collective that we're working on, uh, which is actually working really hard. So it's a collective of artists working really hard in really trying to reinvent uh, the economic systems and enabling external uh, speculative dynamics from the NFT ecosystem to come in, but not to contaminate the internal dynamics and to maintain these very cooperative and sharing dynamics within the collective. So creating like this kind of invisible economy that separates the two. Um, and then there is like uh, other projects. So this is a project that uh, I'm working on with uh, Thomas Saracino, which is uh, an amazing artist that is also a very strongly uh, climate activist. Um, and so we're, we're, we designed this model whereby by changing the, by embedding specific values into the protocol of the NFT, you can actually change the incentive system and therefore changing the payoff structure and somehow modify the activity of people which still want to get to, to maximize the return on investment, but they have to do different things in order to do that. And so the idea is uh, hijacking the speculative dynamics uh, that exist in the NFT space in order to redirect them into more productive uh, usages such as preserving the planet. And so here you can imagine if instead of speculating into uh, the usual real estate in, the, in a particular metaverse, uh, all the parcels in the, metager, in the metaverse were associated with a particular uh, data coming from an oracle that is associated with the actual vitals of a real physical parcel. And so all of a sudden, in instead of just speculating by holding property and just trying to sell it at the right moment, uh, there is an actual connection that exists between the metaverse and the physical world. And so all the, all the people that collect those NFT now have an incentive uh, to ensure that the physical land that the NFT is associated with is also doing well because this is gonna but enhance the visuals, uh, the, the, the visualization of the NFT, but also the, the embedded economic system is such that uh, they can make much more money by reselling the, the land if the land is actually doing well as opposed to but um, another example is Remix NFT. So this is a work that we're doing with uh, Creative Commons. And here again, is the idea is like, let's embed specific values into the protocol of an NFT in order to try and figure out whether we can encourage different type of activities. And so here the idea is that um, all the NFTs are on a perpetual auction. So you cannot hold on to them. There is no, you cannot really own that NFT. You can just buy it and then you hold it until someone else wants to bid a higher price. But while you're holding it, you have the right to creating derivative works of the, of the system. And so this creates this kind of like memification engine in which people are trying to buy uh, the NFT for the purpose of remixing it. And the, the goal is to, the earlier you remix and the better you remix, the more opportunity you have that your remix will become the favorite remix. And so there is this kind of system of like collaboration towards the evolution of a work that no author has actually the possibility to prevent because they released uh, the, the copyright in, in preventing the remixes. And the more people, the more you actually get your work gets remixed, the more profit you're gonna make. Um, and then finally, this is like a new project. So uh, beyond being a legal scholar, I'm also an artist and I love to create blockchain-based life forms of many kinds. Uh, so this is one new project that I'm doing with some friends, um, which I'm, I'm, I'm very attached to. And the idea here is, uh, uh, again, to show that um, we can create NFT protocols that are absolutely non-speculative. Uh, and so aminals cannot be owned. There is no way of actually, you cannot purchase this NFT. It's, it's, a, it's an NFT that exists on the blockchain. And all you can do with the NFT is uh, feed the aminals or uh, you can cuddle the aminals. There is function, you can interact with those aminals. And of course, every function requires payment of some amount of cryptocurrencies. And the more you feed them, the more you cuddle them, the more the aminals get attached to you. Uh, and as they get attached, then you have the right to genetically modify them by proposing new traits. 
And so you're, you can change the genetic code of the aminals that are very close to you. Uh, and what happens is that whenever there's so all the cryptocurrency that is collected by the aminals never gets out, at the exception of when the aminals reproduce themselves. And then they donate some of their funds to the kids. And then the kids will redistribute the money to all the people that have contributed to its genetic code. And so what's interesting here is that it actually eliminates any possible speculation over those NFT. And instead, it creates an economic system by which uh, the aminals are using cryptocurrency in order to incentivize people to actually help them in their evolution and trying to become the most fit for their environment. Um, so. Last slide. Um, basically, all this is to say that uh, uh, blockchain is a revolutionary technology and uh, it can radically modify some of our institutions. And yet, it is a technology can, that can go into many different directions. And uh, we can use it, of course, in order to uh, increase uh, the, the digital scarcity and the speculative dynamics and creating this kind of market-driven governance based on trustless systems, uh, which is actually amazing and super innovative, and I'm very glad this is happening. At the same time, there is another direction that I believe is not sufficiently explored, uh, which is the use of blockchain technology for exploring this more common-based uh, model where we are actually using the blockchain to incentivize people to create more digital abundance and uh, uh, instead of creating those trustless community, we actually want to reinforce the trust within the community. And this is something that is starting now because of this new population of people that are entering to the blockchain, but we're not enough, there is too much focus on this and not enough on this. It's not that one is better than the other, but we actually need as much variety as possible. And this, we already kind of know how it works. This one, I think, is where we will discover a lot of uh, very novel uh, innovations. Thank you. anyone wants to ask a question of that amazing journey through uh, the good and the bad of crypto and, and, and the exceptional, fascinating things we could be doing with it. Um, everyone wants drinks. I get this vibe. Yeah, there's one up the back there, all the way up the back. Hi, sorry, just briefly then. Um, I feel like there's a lot of talk around IP NFTs coming in. I was just wondering, do you have any thoughts on, because um, I know you mentioned, you know, reinventing the wheel and stuff like this, but if we bring IP onto an NFT, is there going to be any value, like new created from that? Or is this just um, maybe just like a hapless idea? Yeah, I mean, that's a very fantastic question. I actually eliminated the slides because I thought it would be too long, but I had a slide about um, what's the problem with the existing model of molecule that is actually just, it's not a problem, but it's like, it's it's not really innovative in the sense that it's just tokenizing IP rights and maybe enabling like a more fragmented ownership of those IP rights, but it's still uh, relying on the concept of IP and uh, um, like, encouraging actually the, the exclusivity of intellectual property on science. Um, and there is actually a lot of very interesting projects that are not so popular because I think many people don't even understand that this will ever potentially have a success because there is no IP. Uh, but uh, there is some projects that are actually using tokenization in order to actually incentivize people to collaborate towards creating actual open and decentralized science that doesn't that, that actually leads to IP only for the purpose of creating a defensive patent license. And then the whole economic model, in the same way as like, um, NFTs, to me, like one of the most amazing things of NFTs is that it shows that we don't need to rely only on copyright in order to monetize. And the same, the same system could be used in order to prove that we actually don't need patents only. We can also design economic system through the tokenization so that the patents only exist as defensive patent license so that no one else can patent. But all the economic model doesn't come from the licensing and the royalty system of the patents, but rather from the tokenization system. So you can actually have an open IP of patents while also maintaining the economic incentive. And whereas the IP NFT, it's great because it's like, let's tokenize those IP rights and let's facilitate the fragmentation and the fractionalization of them, but it doesn't really, it doesn't change the rule of the game. It's actually just 
exacerbating the rule of the game and like leveraging further IP rights in order to monetize, uh, whereas those other systems of this size is, are actually really changing the rule of the game. And of course, it's much more challenging to convince the market that this can work. Uh, but for me, this is actually the interesting thing that, that is worth experimenting with. Okay, it's a question here. Um, you had an interesting slide that I noticed. It went from Web 2 to Web 3 to Web 4. I didn't quite catch what the space component of that Web 4 was. Are you able to elaborate on it? Um, so Web 4 is uh, it's a recent terminology. Um, basically, it's like you add... So, when, so Web 1 is you can receive information. Web 2, you can also provide and share and exchange information. Web3 is basically adding the ownership level. So you, you can own digital assets that in a way that usually you could only own them through licensing. Um, and then Web4 is about the space, is about the speciality. So when you think about the metaverse, what is it? how do you distinguish the internet from the metaverse? Uh, the metaverse usually has some coordinate system. Right? Like you have an avatar which can move around. And so all this specialization is important because one, it enables the existence of the avatar and therefore the accessory of the avatar. But also it means that all of a sudden we're not just talking about content. If I, if I have like the picture of a chair, it's just content. If I have an actual chair into a dimensional space, I have a virtual asset, I have virtual property. Right? And that is a very important distinction. It's not just the copyright in the chair, it's the virtual asset of the chair which incorporates a copyright. So similar to something like Ready Player One? <laughs> is that why we're taking that too? Because um, we talk about the haptic suits and wearables and how does that... Like, we talk about a lot of different types of innovations. I mean, from what I see is when you take all the technology, you need that convergence. So what is... Is that what you mean by that space component for Web4? Yeah, so, I mean, again, yes, there is a possibility which is not marginal that uh, the metaverse will start looking more and more like uh, Ready Player One, which is uh, quite a dystopian vision of the metaverse where you have like one big centralized operator that controls everything. Um, there is another not marginal possibility that the metaverse will actually evolve into a much more open and decentralized system. And to me, this is actually where NFTs are key to this, because as long as the assets do not exist outside, of the virtual world operator, then, then we are stuck into the Ready Player One model. And I'm not saying that the fact that NFTs are coming is gonna make us escape from that, but at least this is opening a window or a door in which we might try to escape from that model into a different model. And I love the flat earth visual that you showed there too. Final question here. Um, th thanks for the very wonderful talk. So uh, basically uh, I'd like to ask you to comment on the concept of the proof of ownership uh, versus the enforcement of ownership rights, right? So basically you can own an, an NFT, but obviously as long as you're relying on a Web2, let's say, marketplace, um, they can they can kind of interfere with, with the value or actually, you know, kind of seize the opportunity that it creates for you. Um, but in, in the real world, the enforcement of ownership rights are are basically held by state governments um, by international copyright laws what what can what can be done to rip i guess replicate or not replicate but basically may, um, maybe replace um, the current system with a with a with a with something similar that can enforce the ownership rights so that that can enforce on the blockchain or no uh, no, no actually the actual the actual use case basically a censorship resistant set ownership rights right so it, it, it basically it prevents. I, I guess currently the NFTs are, are are live on the blockchain, but they are they are always handled through Web2 centralized organizations that are kind of held by well the the IPFS yes, but the the marketplaces in themselves they are they are governed still. Well, yes, that's, well, that's, I mean it's, it's just a matter of like right now like those marketplaces are facilitating the trade. Uh, the NFT could potentially be traded outside of the marketplace. Uh, it's just that there is no decentralized NFT marketplace that really has uh, appeared yet, but there is no, I don't think there is any technical challenge in doing that. It's just that there's probably no demand. <laughs> but eventually, perhaps like when those, when those uh, centralized platforms start 
removing royalty, uh, actually censoring content, and uh, in some way like abusing the rights, then that might actually trigger the emergence of uh, decentralized marketplaces for NFTs.